your official contact for the best alternative talk on the planet. KGRARadio.com. However you are and whenever you are, welcome back everyone to Power Normal Now. I'm your host, Alan B. Smith, and we are live on Spreaker, and as always, rebroadcasting every Wednesday night, Thursday morning at 1 a.m. Eastern Standard Time on the KGRA, the official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. Uh, join us tonight as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Our guest tonight... I ask that when you listen to tonight's guests, that you don't dismiss offhandedly this bizarre story of a very real man that happened to very real people. And joining us in just a bit is Travis Walton and director of Travis, the true story of Travis Walton, Jennifer Stein. Travis is a 90-minute documentary film recounting the now world-famous 1975 UFO abduction of Travis Walton and the impact it has had on his and the lives of others who were also involved. Now, if you have questions, we will be taking calls tonight in the second hour, and I will be giving that number out a little bit later, closer to the second hour. That said, I am technically a bit limited tonight, so I can only take one phone call at a time. So if I miss your call for whatever reason, don't give up easily and just try back again. During the show, share your thoughts and experiences with us or after the show on Facebook, facebook.com slash Paranormal Now Radio, Instagram at Paranormal Now, Twitter at Paranormal underscore now, and of course on Stellar.com. And now, for your paranormal words of wisdom from Dr. Rita Luis of SoulHealer.com. Hi, I'm Dr. Reed Louise from SoulHealer.com. My paranormal word of wisdom is trust. God, spirit, or our higher self communicates to us through images, through sounds, or through subtle feelings that we experience in our bodies. By paying attention to the communication that we receive on one of these levels is our intuition at work. And so by trusting the guidance that we're receiving will take us to that perfect place within our lives and within ourselves. So trust your intuition. And thank you to Dr. Rita Luis of SoulHealer.com. Uh, Rita and I actually met several years ago, maybe four or five years ago, actually, on the Inception Radio Network when I had started out there with Epic Voyages Radio. Um, all right, so to ask our guest a question, please join us in the Spreaker chat room to teleport your thoughts and uh, to speak with us in the second hour. I will give that number out um, again. Travis Walton, driving home after a day of clearing brush in the forest, six lumberjacks come upon a 40-foot disc hovering silently over the crest of a ridge. As if spellbound, Travis Walton jumps from the passenger side of the truck, running towards it for a closer look. That decision, November 5th, 1975, would change him forever. The decision, 1975. The 21-year-old logger from Snowflake, Arizona, was struck by a powerful blue beam of light from the craft. He disappeared for five days, igniting a firestorm of controversy aimed at the logging crew who were the last to see him. Travis Walton's 1975 experience comes alive as he recounts the ordeal. Travis combines new and archived interviews with the logging crew, police, and the polygraph examiner. Walton explains how this event changed his life forever as the media, skeptics, and debunkers attacked him, his friends, and family. UFO experts explain why this story continues to astound investigators, astrophysicists, and journalists as they investigate for reliable evidence of other worlds, other beings, and more advanced technologies. 
Our second guest, Jennifer Stein, has been making documentaries since 1989. In 2012, Jennifer won the two Open Minds International UFO Congress Film Festival Awards for the Disclosure Dialogues with filmmaker Ron James. Then in 2015, two EBEs at the 2015 Open Minds Film Festival for Travis, the true story of Travis Walton, that she co-produced with Bob Terrio, Ron James, and Zachary Wheel. Travis has won official selection awards from the Burbank Film Festival, the Chain NYC Festival, the Synonymous Film Festival, the Philip K. Dick, and Chain Film Festivals, and more. A self-taught filmmaker who never went to film school. She first gathered the life of her good friend, Rita Levin, who died in a terrorist attack in Israel. Her film, a fundraiser, dramatized the cause for women's legal aid in Carmel, Israel. Jennifer and Travis, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for thank coming you, on. Alan. Thanks for having me. Actually, I appreciate it. Sure, thank you for coming on. Um, so the story is a well-known story. There's no no doubt about that. And there's a lot of questions I think people still have about what actually happened to you, Travis. Um, so what I, I'll say here at the start is that I have no intention personally of comparing the film Fire in the Sky with what actually happened because I, I don't want to confuse the facts of what actually happened to you. And that's what makes this film great uh, because it not only tells it the story linearly in a way that you can digest the film, but it also provides detailed information that the dramatized version just, it just didn't. Um, and granted that film was really entertaining for me and, um, it had an impact in my life and my early years, a number of things impacted my life and my interest in ufology. Um, but ultimately what we're looking for is the truth. And so Jennifer, uh, what was it for you initially that gave you the resolve to make a film about Travis's story? Well, um, a, a number of things. Firstly, m when I got to meet Travis and understand and learn the type of person that he is, he's not a person that really seeks any sort of limelight and he never exaggerated his story and uh, I was impressed with his humility, and I realized as a filmmaker, hey, this is a golden opportunity because most people know this story as per the Fire in the Sky version, which was fictionalized. And if they really knew the true story, it may help people begin to digest the reality that we are probably not alone. And I myself have had a a, a sighting, nothing nearly as dramatic as an experience as Travis. I've never had an abduction or anything like that, but I've had enough experience in my life to come to the conclusion we're not alone. And wanting to be able to deeply dialogue that with other people from the time I was 19 mm -hmm. encouraged me to want to do out-of-the-box projects. And when I decided to start to do film work, this was just a golden opportunity sitting on the table kind of waiting for me. And it, I, I say it as an opportunity. Really, it was, you know, um, also a huge challenge because I, I didn't have a lot of money to make a film. And I really tried to make a very decent one on a small budget with some talented people who were all willing to push their sleeves up and uh, just, you know, put the pedal to the metal and the whatever the, gr you know, put the mind to the grindstone and do the best possible job we could. And um, I think I achieved my intentions for sure. And, and Travis still talks to me. I think he's happy <laughs> with the film. Uh, that was a real goal of mine to do something mm -hmm. that honored Travis. And um, I haven't looked back. I have no regrets. I'm, it's, it's done a lot to bring the real story to the forefront and, I, you know, I think people around the world now have a better sense of who Travis is, mm -hmm. who have never met him and never may meet him. But because of seeing this film, they have a way to climb inside and understand this from a personal perspective. Right. Travis, what was it about Jennifer that uh, earned your trust? 
Well, uh, she uh, seemed willing to work with me, you know, to try to get it right. And, you know, there were a few little points where uh, we tweaked it to uh, make it more precise. And uh, she was perfectly amenable to correcting any misunderstandings. And, and that was a big factor for me because I was so fed up with uh, people who uh, you know, didn't, weren't all that precise and didn't really <laughs> think it was that important. Uh, but it is extraordinarily important, I think, not obviously just for us, but for, for you. Um, I know in the, you know, I don't know, the 80s and 90s, you, you weren't exactly out there um, as much as you are now talking about the film, sharing about your story. Um, what changed? Well, I just got fed up with it. I uh, went to work uh, at the paper mail uh, uh, um, and just uh, put my head down and worked 12 hours a day for <laughs> for uh, seven years straight and, and yeah. uh, uh, just kind of was, you know, fed up with the, uh, the um, public aspect of things that were coming my way. Well, I think one question everybody wants to know is, after this, did you continue to chop wood, Travis? Well, I did have to. I, you know, it's kind of like that old thing about you get thrown off the horse, you got to get back on, just mm-hmm. to, you know, get your head straight. So um, I I did go back and, and do a little bit of uh, work in the woods with my chainsaw. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I set that aside, and once I conquered that... Uh, thing I, I i tried to avoid being there late in the evening but <laughs> I, <laughs> well, I, did, I, I uh, could imagine yeah and and I, I agree with you obviously um only to some degree uh going back to work can sort of help you you know just just going through the motions of doing something can help you distract your mind from what's happened um and that and that brings me to this this idea of that you discuss now i think more so is that what you experienced was really post-traumatic stress disorder, wasn't it, PTSD? Yeah, yeah. I, you know, they didn't have that term back then, but, you know, I, I felt like I was experiencing some kind of a thing that goes by that uh, name today. Uh, you know, they they called it shell shock or battle fatigue or something back then, but uh, it, it was definitely, you know, a, 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 had my head all twisted up. Actually, all the boys did from interviewing uh, most of the living, you know, loggers. And most of them never went back to work either. I mean, the whole crew fell apart. They came under huge amounts of scrutiny. The whole town was, you know, uh, their reputations were destroyed. And then there was the Philip Class attacks that came from them, you know, from he was a major debunker Mm -hmm. so there were terrible newspaper articles written about them you know that's one of the things we did at the 40th anniversary conference is we literally printed all of the articles from the local paper there in heber and when you read these you realize that you know these boys were not believed everything was alleged this alleged that they claimed this and and, you know, people just thought they made the story up. Uh, Philip Class came up with this idea. They made it up to get out of a logging contract, which was absurd. That it, it served no purpose. They couldn't get out of the logging contract. If they didn't finish it, they weren't going to get paid. And even still, they Mike uh, took a big financial hit, the crew boss, because of this. So really, it's it, it destroyed a lot of their lives. And a lot of them didn't actually even continue to be friends and talk to each other and a lot of them moved away and so it was a very big net negative well you know um, travis i'm sure you've spoken about this many times and and you too jen um about the the story you know start middle and end um so i'd like to get to that but before i do i really i really am curious travis and um this comes from a somewhat personal experience because you I don't know if you remember, but in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, this past summer, we had met very briefly, took a photo with you, um, and there was a there was a, a little girl there. I don't know if you remember. She was taking photos, and she was priding herself on being a photographer. Um, it, it was really cute, and and I, I I realized in that moment that I felt like I'm treating you like a celebrity, right? And a lot of other people are treating you like a celebrity. 
And it's an odd thing. It's really uh, for me to think in that term because it's like, wait a minute, you know, do you, you know, does a, a military veteran come back or someone who's had a car accident, you know, under extreme circumstances and they survive, you know, how many of those people do we sort of, you know, ask for a signed autograph or a poster and put it on our wall? Um, you know, obviously there's... Well, you know, it was certainly weird to have that kind of a switch, you know, and uh, that's even uh, occurred locally, you know. I uh, have uh, recently commented on that phenomenon because it's actually more recent that it, that it's switched that way. I go out, um, you know, to the store here locally and and I get a completely different response. Back Back at the time it happened, I avoided going out in town because... I would see people I knew, and they would pretend they didn't see me, pretend they didn't know me. Now I go out, and I see people I don't know who pretend they do know me. So, <laughs> it, and, uh, you know, and say hi and act like we're old buddies and uh, uh, friendly in a positive way. So that's all fine. And, uh, so it, it doesn't um, bother you that people kind of treat you like a, like a Hollywood celebrity like? Well, I'll tell you what. One thing I, I have been guarded against uh, is to let it affect who I am as a person. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, right after it happened, Dr. Harder put me on the phone with Betty Hill, and that was one of the uh, uh, you know, cautions that she had about uh, the response uh, that uh, might, uh, the reaction that people might have. Uh, don't let it change who you are. And and uh, I've always uh, tried to stick to that. Uh, none of that stuff has anything to do with who I am. You know, my mm -hmm. closest friends and relatives, you know, as far as they're concerned, it's the same old me. And Jennifer, what was your experience, you know, first meeting Travis and communicating with him? Well, of course, uh, I was um, very... Uh, also kind of starstruck a little bit, like, well, this, this is the real guy, you know? And of course right. you want to immediately jump in and start asking him really deeply personal questions that you know are like not probably appropriate. But because I got to do a film, I kind of was able to step over that hurdle, but I didn't try to do that at our first dinner. Uh, actually, a mutual friend named Peter Robbins, a, a dear friend in New York uh, City, you probably know him. Uh, he lives yep. up in Ithaca. Yep. Now. He's a writer. And so Peter asked me to help him run the Roswell Conference because I used to be an event coordinator. And uh, uh, I did okay. like weddings and bar mitzvahs mm -hmm. and things. You know, UFO conferences, it's kind of similar. It overlaps. It's the same sorts of things. There's a beginning, middle, and end, and the middle has to be good, right? <laughs> and I'm a well, you know, I, w I was at a couple of uh, events uh, where there were some real celebrities uh, in attendance, and overhearing their conversations about their attitude towards their fans and towards themselves, well, it was shocking to me. I was a real jaw-dropper that <laughs> anybody could be that arrogant it just astonished me how ungrateful they were for uh you know the adulation they were getting travis and i were both recently at alien con in um uh, in baltimore mm -hmm. and it was uh, put on by the prometheus group who does the ancient aliens so they had a star-studded uh, lineup of course travis was part of that but um I was not a speaker. I was, you know, I, I was there as an attendee, um, but it was uh, interesting. I, I can agree with Travis. There's a lot of egos in this field, and I think that's one of the things I really admire about Travis, that he has stayed very grounded. And unlike a lot of people, I, people may not think of this or realize it right off the bat, but Travis never really had a choice like other people people do to step into this field or to come forward because he was struck by this light right and his friends drove away because they were frightened and then Travis goes missing these this craft or these beings picked him up somehow and took off with him so then he was missing for five days and during those five days this became an international firestorm of a story 
I know I'm kind of jumping ahead for you, Alan, but we'll, we'll you know, go back around. That's fine. It's, yeah. it, it's important because it broke in the news as a homicide story, as a missing person story, and as a UFO story. So the phones in Heber and Snowflake, the local police and the sheriff, they were ringing off the hook with calls from Japan and Russia and Germany and Hawaii and Belgium and every UFO group you can imagine around the country descends on these small little towns, as well as probably Secret Service and military that don't identify themselves and people with, you know, uh, radar detection and, and background radiation uh, devices and trifield meters and things like this. And so by the time Travis has returned, everybody knows his name and everybody's hounding to get a piece of this mm. man's experience and to debunk him and whatnot. So Travis didn't have the choice that most people make when they step forward in this field. And I think that speaks a lot for the integrity uh, that Travis had to develop and the, the compassion he had to find for himself in the midst of this whirlwind. And uh, if his brother hadn't have been there watching out for him and caring for him, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I could have gone through what Travis went through. Yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely amazing, Travis, uh, your brother, from what I understand, um, how he was there for you. And again, when we get back from the, the first break, we'll, we'll kind of start from the beginning of the story and work our way forward. But um, your brother, Dwayne, he was really, in a sense, your caretaker and defender in those early days, wasn't he? Yeah, I, I would not have survived without his uh, defending me and protecting me because, you know, the people who wanted to do to grill me and inter, uh, interview me intensely, that would have destroyed me at that time. I I was hanging by a thread, and he was seemed to be the only one who understood how fragile a uh, uh, condition I was in. Right. Well, here I'm going to play a clip for you guys um, from the film, and this is uh, Travis's brother Dwayne's. Just a 20 second clip. Here's on the UFO. Uh, he thinks now there is some small time loss in there. But uh, for all intent and purposes, he spent five days on there. He did come in contact with some beings that are human like, but they weren't human. Obviously, Dwayne, you know your own brother probably better than anybody else. Uh, do you believe the story? I've never seen him play a practical joke in his adult life. And your brother says, I've never seen him play a practical joke in his adult life. I mean, I'm guessing you do have a sense of humor, though. Yeah, I, can, I, I <laughs> I'm not completely uh, <laughs> dour, but some people say that they, you know, taking pictures, they uh, smile, and I say I am smiling, <laughs> <laughs> smiling on the inside, right? Um, I, I have a hard time imagining that anyone would would pull off a hoax for five days and disappear for five days in the first place. Um, you know, what were the initial accusations or assumptions of where you would have hidden? Well, some of it was just that um, I had somehow become um, disoriented and was just wandering around in the woods. And, you know, this, these 50 searchers were just unable to locate me, that somehow I had been uh, hit by uh, earthquake lights, you know, some sort of a tectonic shift and in the in the blast of energy uh caused uh, me to have this delusion uh there was theories about um uh drug hallucination that the whole crew was hallucinating on drugs and and all of this is just uh, you know there was even a theory about a transitory psychosis that i had temporarily become insane and you know, the reason I could pass a lie detector test is because I believed it. I was just crazy for a while. Mm. And, but um, I had a whole battery of psychiatric tests that proved that I was totally normal. I had a whole battery of medical tests uh, that, that had uh, pointed in a different direction. But one test uh, uh, or, or tests, a uh, set of tests, were was to have uh, blood and urine samples put through the county medical examiner's uh, drug screen, which is a, a law enforcement entity, and, and there was uh, no trace of any drug whatsoever in my body. And, you know, what, what the uh, um, um, 
people throwing this idea out there fail to take into consideration is how how are seven people going to have an identical hallucination? I, I don't know. That's confounding. Um, but when we get back after this first break, Travis, let's tar- take it right from the very beginning of your story. Um, for those who are not too familiar with your story in the first place, um, to get them a chance to to get the full breath and understand um, everything that we're talking about here tonight. This is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now. Uh, Stay tuned. We will be right back in just a few minutes. For years, the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station has been your contact for live UFO paranormal talk radio worldwide, bringing you the top names in research and investigations seven nights a week. Our listeners connect to the KGRA on various platforms like TalkStream Live, TuneIn, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and many more. Now, you can stream your favorite paranormal talk radio shows with our new fully integrated custom of KGRA mobile apps for Android and iPhones. Listen to your favorite paranormal talk shows from any mobile device 24-7, free with smartphone or tablet. Utilize custom features to access news, show pages, archives, contests, events, and live interactive chat rooms. Set Set show notification alerts and never miss your favorite live programs. All free and available to download in Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Mark Slade Investigates the Stephenville UFO. Written by renowned UFO investigator Ken Sherry, the Stephenville UFO tells the story of the infamous UFO sightings of Stephenville, Texas in 2008, where local residents witnessed unknown craft and lights in the sky chased by military planes. These sightings would set off a series of events that would quickly become one of the most controversial and well-documented UFO cases in U.S. history. Mark Slade investigates the Stephenville UFO is a fascinating and frightening tale of sinister plots and shadow government agencies vying for control of the nation. Author and researcher Ken Cherry has woven an intricate tale that shines a light on an ominous chapter of American history and proving that not everything is as it seems. Mark Slade investigates the Stephenville UFO is now available on Amazon.com. Don't Lie by Septembrio. Michael 8, if you're listening, a shout out to you, brother. If you want to find out more about Septembrio's music, you can go to septembrio.com. That's S E P T E M B R Y O.com. This is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now. We'll be right back.
your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. And this is Alan B. Smith for Power Normal Now and KGRA Radio. Uh, I am back with my guests, Travis Walton and Jennifer Stein, to talk about one of the most fascinating abduction stories of quite possibly all time. And, and I don't say that superfluously. That's, um, uh, it, it's, there's nothing like it that's been so well documented. And it really is confounding that this has happened you know, so many decades ago, and we're still, still trying to convince the debunkers that this is a real event. And granted, I understand your skepticism. I absolutely do. It sounds utterly fantastic. But I think if you hear the story tonight, and as Jennifer and Travis lay out the evidence for you, I hope that you'll make an informed decision without jumping to any um, pre-conclusions. Um, so, Travis and Jennifer, welcome back. And, I'm here. All right. So let's let's start from the beginning, uh, Travis, if you wouldn't mind, just taking us on that initial drive to the site. Well, um, that day was just an ordinary work day, you know, long, hard physical labor all day long, and uh, you know. You put in that kind of uh, hard physical labor. Who's who's thinking about a prank <laughs> at that time? All we were thinking about was getting home and getting some uh, dinner and getting ready for the next day. But uh, you know, we packed up our gear and we're headed out of there. Um, in the movie, it gives the impression we had been driving for some time and had gotten drowsy. I think that's partly to suggest that maybe we had some sort of uh, sleep delusion or something. But, you know, we, we were still, you know, uh, breathing hard from our recent work. I mean, we hadn't gone that long from the job, and we saw this glow coming through the trees. Um, it wasn't anything alarming right off the bat. It was just like, what could that be, you know? The name of the movie, Fire in the Sky, comes from, you know, uh, this situation where we had actually been driving to work one morning and uh, lightning had hit a tree and caught it on fire up high up above the ground level. Mm -hmm. And we stopped and put the fire out. It's not unusual. Sometimes uh, the Forest Service would come and get us to fight a fire because, you know, we were a crew who knew how to do it, had the tools and everything, and at a moment's notice we'd go do something like that. But um, so we were, our first impression was, you know, what is it? It's just idle curiosity. I don't even know if the other guys saw it as soon as I did because I was sitting in the front. And this was the, uh, the Mogollon Rim, correct, Travis? Yeah, this is the Mogollon Rim. In Arizona. You know, I... Mm -hmm. Uh, later, I uh, you know it's seven thousand feet there, and I later discovered that the uh, that area right there has the second highest frequency of lightning strikes of any place in the continental United States, and uh, that kind of gives me a clue about uh, the incident too. But uh, we'll get to that later. Um, so we're seeing this uh, glow coming through the trees, and I was thinking probably deer hunters camped. At first, that was my first thought. But then I realized that even though the the hill sloped up to our right and there was a ridge up there, uh, uh, the light was coming from higher than where a, a, a camper or a tent uh, would be. Uh, and so that wasn't fitting in. Uh, it was too late for it to be a sunset. Uh, the moon was in the other direction. Uh, it was just, what could that be? And uh, so... Pretty soon, some of the others were saying, well, what's what's up with that? And they were, you know, coming, kind of going through the same checklist about what that might be. Uh, but we were kind of gearing up, thinking maybe we're going to fight a fire. But, it, you know, we hadn't had any uh, um, of that kind of weather. So I said, Mike, hurry up and get up there where we can see, see what it is. Because I could see that there was an opening in the trees and the glow was sort of shining across our path ahead. Uh, Travis, when so, you say Mike, Mike was the crew boss. Yeah, Mike was the crew boss. He was driving. So, you know, it was me asking him to hurry up. Uh, he was uh, on uh, driving the truck, obviously. I was uh, on the uh, opposite side of the truck. Uh, 
another crewman in, in between us and four in the back. There was all seven of us in a double cab truck. But um, as soon as we got up there to where that glow was crossing the road, boom, there it was. Unmistakable. No doubt about it. Somebody in the back yelled out, it's a flying saucer. I mean, you know, the, the, the debunker theory that what we saw was the planet Jupiter off in the distance, that's the first thing to do is check the astronomical charts and whatever uh, is visible at that time, that's what it's got to be. But, you know, this was a, a, a glowing metallic disk. It was, it, absolutely, it was so awesome. It was incredible. And uh, everybody, you know, was stunned by it. But uh, I yelled out, stop the truck, thinking that this thing would take off. And anything, you know, wild animals, you get a glimpse and you're lucky if you can get the crew to look before it, it gets away. So that was kind of the back of my mind, mm -hmm. thinking that this will be like that bear that crossed the road <laughs> before, uh, where by the time I get running towards it, it's going to be hot, long gone. So I jumped out and started running towards it, and, and this, of course, uh, uh, kind of alarmed the rest of the crew, and they were yelling at me to come back. Uh, but I was uh, seeing that this thing was not taken off like I had presumed, but uh, the fear that they were uh, immediately experiencing, uh, I wasn't too far behind. I was... Uh, probably uh, scared or more than they were, but I, I didn't want to show it. Um, it was making a, a very strange sort of a sound, a, a, a mixture of um, highs and lows, a very powerful sound that kind of penetrated the body in strange ways, uh, not just coming to you through your ears. It's a, just kind of, kind of like vibrated your bones. Uh, the, the guy said they could feel the vibration in the truck, but uh, there was also this uh, glow uh, that just made everything in the area seem, it was kind of an ethereal, weird sort of a feeling in the whole clearing there. Where, where did the glow uh, come from? It just in the center of the craft or the whole craft or... Uh, m m most of the surface of the craft, parts of it were dark metallic and parts of it were reflective, but I I've tried to describe this weird effect that, that the glow was coming from a surface that was so shiny that it was both giving off light and reflecting the, the surrounding trees at the same time. It's kind of like when you're watching television and the window's open and you can see the light on the television screen at the same time you can see the image that's on TV. Uh, but um, the closer I got, I, w I got, I stopped when I was about looking up at about a 45 degree angle and it was, I was just astonished. You know, I was, uh, uh, the, some of the guys, you know, Alan and, and Steve said it looked like I was in some kind of trance, but you know, Turn around, look at them. They look pretty entranced uh, themselves. You <laughs> but know? So you didn't feel like you were in a trance. You felt like you were just kept. No, in. I, I said, Steve, you know, I, I, you know, it feels like it was my own idea. And he says, Well, if they have mind control, they can make you think it's your idea. But uh, <laughs> Touché. You know, it's hard to hard to argue with that. But you know, um, it it wasn't that far out of character for me to 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 go up there like that. But you know, but, and you the, were twenty-one years old. I mean, I, I get that—the the sort of impetuous. Twenty-two, yeah, but twenty-two. Uh, impulsive, mm -hmm. uh, you know, certainly much, much more impulsive than than I was in the in the aftermath of that. Oh but, well, yeah. I mean, we've all done stupid things where once we've committed, we feel like, all right, well, we got to go through with this now. Yeah, I I, I didn't want to. Uh, show that I was afraid, but right, you know right. they would have worked themselves in pretty much of a frenzy. It's just, you know, in the movie it says you know, shows that they're swearing at me and yelling at me. Got me. That part of the movie is pretty accurate. You know, it was uh, they were getting really worked up, and it was affecting me too. Uh, but about well, I, the time I decided to heed their warning, heard their calls, and, mm -hmm. and, and and run back to the truck, it suddenly got louder and started to move, sort of um, 
went up a little bit in a kind of an unsteady way. Mm -hmm. And I jumped for the nearest cover. There was just a log sticking up there. And I jumped down behind that. And uh, they said, let's go, let's go, you know. And uh, I didn't need to be re reminded. Uh, it was time to go. Um, so I stood up with the idea that I would run back to the truck. And it was at that moment, right when I straightened up, that I felt this shock hit me. It was like I'd been hit by a truck. Uh, the, 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 the description that they gave of the blast of the energy that hit me is n nothing I felt because I was instantly unconscious. Mm -hmm. um, they said it was so violent that they had no doubt immediately that it had killed me. So what, was um, it less of like a tractor beam and more of like a jolt that lifted you into the air and then dropped you? Right. It was, you know, the way they made it look in the movie is like it picked me up and kind of mm -hmm. held me for a minute. You know, you know, Hollywood, of course, their idea was what, what if somebody's looking at their popcorn at that moment and misses it, you know? <laughs> but it was just sort of an instantaneous blast. It was <laughs> on and, and, uh, and, and, um, uh, it, it threw me through the air 15 or 20 feet. Now, um, I got a look at the sheriff's file years later, and some of the crew described it as looking like a foot-wide laser beam. Uh, another compared it to a bolt of lightning. And another uh, actually call, uh, said it looked like a long blue flame. Mm -hmm. This well, was in uh, different deputies wrote these reports. They, right. Not not every crewman was interviewed by the sheriff himself. But um, what well, happened to you so so fast? I mean, did you catch a glimpse of it, like in that instant that it hit you, or was it just so fast? No, yeah, it was too 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 quick. I, I just yeah. blacked out. It was just okay. numbing shock. Kind of felt kind of like an electric shock, but kind of like. I'd been hit very forcefully, you know. Right, and clearly so, Venus doesn't do that. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. But um, I, I had no idea about anything about when I struck the ground or anything. I, I rely on their descriptions. But um, John said that uh, my body landed like a sack of meat, like there wasn't a bone in my body. Mm. Uh, Steve uh, at the time was suggesting that it disintegrated me that I wasn't even in one piece but I, you know I always try to emphasize that those guys deserve a great deal of credit for coming back I mean they, yeah. they fled at the time that was uh, the smartest thing at that moment you know um, there's no sense in getting somebody else killed to save a dead man well, yeah. but well, Steve Rogers, didn't he um, feel that he had to protect his crew? Uh, no, Mike Rogers. Oh, Mike, I'm uh, sorry, Mike Rogers. Would, yep, yep. Yeah, he, he was definitely, you know, trying to, uh, you know, prevent another incident. They, mm -hmm. You know, who's next? Right, exactly. Everybody was yelling, go, 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 you know, and he, he didn't. So he was responding both instinctively and to, you know, the calls of the crew, he said, uh, to uh, get the hell out of there. Yeah. Uh, they went up, uh, tried to catch some deer hunters, and were unable to. Now, in the movie, when Mike pulls over and says, look, this truck is going back, anybody that wants to wait here uh, can. In the movie, everybody waits for Mike to go back alone. Well, that's, you know, to add to the mystery of what really happened, but the truth is, None of those guys volunteered to get out of the truck and wait in the dark for Mike to come back. <laughs> they all elected to stay with the truck and, and go back, um, some a little bit reluctantly, but they all, you know, I, I give them all a lot of credit for having the guts to do that because they had no idea what they might run into when they got back to the site. Yeah. Now, in the movie, there was a little um, thing with the sheriff uh is this the spot or not, you know? And there was no confusion because when Mike took off, he spun the tires, which dug a hole in the road. So he, he said he was able to find the spot, find my footprints, and um, my body was not where it had been. So 
they uh, all huddled around one flashlight and uh, walked around the immediate area, they said, uh, seeing if I'd crawled off in an injured state. But uh, yeah. and apparently uh, you know, calling you, calling your name. Yeah, that's what they said. You know, at one point, uh, you know, Ken says that Mike actually fell down to his knees and started crying. So that's when he was hit by the enormity of this whole thing and, you know, his guilt over taking off. But, you know, they they were, you know, yelling at him to leave, too, you know, and it really was the smartest uh, thing to do. You and uh, Mike are real close friends now, aren't you? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, some of the others were crying by the time they got to the um, sheriff's men. But uh, um, that's yeah. what made, the, uh, that's what clued the, 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 the sheriff and his men into thinking something serious had happened. But they suspected it was just a cover story for a murder that, you know, that they had gotten a fight. Somebody had gotten a fight with me and they all agreed to cover up what happened to me and. Right. Well, and Jennifer was Jennifer was just letting me know that uh, the boys actually saw the craft um, go go back from whence it came, right? Yeah, yeah, they saw it take off, and and you know after we got a look at the sheriff's file years later, uh, local um, fishermen, campers, hunters, deer hunters, whatever, uh, also saw it leaving the area and reported it to the sheriff. So, how do you know how how many witnesses? all told had seen the craft that particular craft at that time Mm -hmm. i don't know and uh that uh, was something you know the sheriff uh, hung on to that file even uh, had copies of uh a lot of those uh, documents at his home Mm -hmm. but the new sheriff came in and just ordered uh, his men to take all that stuff out and dump it in the hole and burn it uh, which is illegal, but that's what they, they're, I'm told they did. Um, anyway, um, some copies of that material, you know, later on, uh, as the sheriff's investigation continued over the years, uh, you know, even after he left office and as sheriff and became a county supervisor, he, he became a, a lot more... Um, um, conversational with with Mike and the crew and stuff, you know, because obviously once I had been returned and after everybody passed lie detector test, at that point the sheriff, you know, really, I think, had already started to accept that we were telling the truth. And uh, I think Jennifer's film is the first time he ever admitted that on camera. Uh, basically, he was saying... Uh, how did he put it? It seemed like they were basically trying to tell the truth, and you know, he was hedging his his uh, parsing his words there. But over the years, I got uh, um, emails and texts from his closest friends and relatives who were saying privately he he believes you, but he just doesn't want to say that in public. So when when they were out looking for you with one flashlight, you know, did Mike finally just decide? Okay, we have to call it quits. And and what what gave him uh, the impetus to make that decision and just and go get help? Well, uh, they it was dark. It was uh, you know they weren't getting any. Uh, they weren't finding me. They uh, they just felt like uh, it was something bigger than they uh, were in a position to handle on their own. Mm-hmm. And something serious had happened here. And. Uh, um, I don't know what was going through his mind. It seems like, uh, you know, the sensible thing to do at the time. Some of the crew uh, disputed that decision. They thought, well, let's just wait until tomorrow. We'll get some of our friends with, with guns and come back in daylight. You know, they, so, they didn't like the dark. <laughs> yeah, so there was obviously an inc- inclination there um, or suspicion that they would be under suspicion. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that and, uh, you know, people aren't going to like this, and uh, you know they didn't. Uh, um, you know, one or two of the guys had been in trouble. You know, minor scrapes with the law before, and mm-hmm. you know, it just 
their first impulse wasn't to go to the authorities, but they finally all decided that was the thing to do. Well, and then, so where were you next? Where did you find yourself next after this light hit you? Well, uh, my next perception, I was waking up uh, very uh, slowly. I was in and out for a while in a lot of pain, semi-conscious. Um, but when I could, you know, I, my, my initial impression from the surroundings was mm-hmm. uh, that I had been taken to the hospital. Probably the fact that I was hurting so much and that I felt mortally wounded contributed to that. The fact that I was on my back and there was a light above me and the ceiling was so close, I figured I was probably on, on on an operating table or a gurney or something. Do you think that you were being operated on? Do you think that you know, something, or were you just were they just in watching you and I, monitoring I, I, you? Yeah, in hindsight, I, I think that there was some kind of uh, treatment going on. Mm-hmm. At the time, right after it happened, I. I, you know, kind of accepted the popular idea that it was some kind of a um, an exam, like it was some kind of a biological specimen or something. But in hindsight, you know, putting all the different factors together, I really think that, you know, uh, the description of as abduction was less accurate than the idea that it was more of an of an ambulance call that. Uh, Something had happened that uh, had severely injured or killed me, and the, the only uh, technology in a position to, you know, help me was uh, something they offered, because uh, nearest hospital uh, was over an hour away. Well, whether it was Sholo or or Pace, in either one, and even even if it was as simple as cardiac arrest. Uh, None of those guys knew CPR. Right. And also they would know, obviously, whoever they are, the cause of what harmed you. And so perhaps they would obviously be best suited to treat that condition. Yeah. And having a vastly superior technology, I I think that's a reasonable assumption. Um Especially in hindsight, you know, I've had uh, decades to try to figure out what happened here. And uh, um, I I mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, the second highest frequency of lightning strikes in the United States is right there. Well, you know, uh, on occasion, I've actually seen lightning out of a a clear blue sky. So the idea that this craft could have incidentally not intentionally, but created some kind of an electromagnetic field Mm -hmm. that drew a lightning strike. And so mm, I was the secondary discharge. Something could have come down, hit it, a blast of energy, drawn in by the energy of the craft itself and whatever makes them fly. And then then the secondary discharge uh, hit me, uh, possibly fatally. So like a lightning rod, it it drew the lightning, passed through the craft, hit you. Um, yeah, that, that's a, a, my more recent theory. Just you know, uh, not too long ago, I did a a TV show with uh, Rob Lowe called The Low Files, but it was a two part show. And the second part was this lady that does deals in crystals at uh, gym shows and stuff. And you know what he said to tie the two segments together was. Well, Travis told me that the aliens might be in the area mining for fulgurite, which was totally astonishing to me because I didn't know what fulgurite was. What the heck is he talking about? So I went online and found out that it's a kind of a crystal in structure that's that's formed when lightning strikes the ground. You got millions of volts and millions of degrees forming crystals that are not mm. formed uh, under any other circumstance. They're not formed geologically. So, you know, with all those um, attempts to try to figure out what they were doing there, uh, you know, we were looking at 
magnetic lines of force, underground mineral supplies, or you know deposits, um, 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 water supplies that might be under the ground, or, or you know mm-hmm. e- even the idea that might have been some kind of um, um, agricultural experiment. You know, none of that was really panning out so much as this fulgurite idea that the, it, they might have had an interest in a particular t- uh, rare mineral that would be more abundant there than any place else in the in the country. Well, that, that, that is fascinating. I mean, we do find, um, when we use our imaginations scientifically, like in science, science fiction, um, you know, minerals or crystals uh, seem to serve a, a higher purpose for energy or some other property that, you know, we humans have not yet, you know, quite gotten a grasp of and also this happened in um uh jennifer was just telling me the sitgreaves national forest which is the world's largest ponderosa pine forest in the world um so this location itself is it seems to me is, is a very special place in the first place and um with all the lightning strikes that's happening there it it's naturally like a paranormal place uh, but travis we'll have to pick it up after we get back from the second and last break. Um, so everybody stay tuned. This is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now. I'm speaking with Travis Walton and director of the film Travis Jennifer Stein. We will be right back. For years, the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station has been your contact for live UFO paranormal talk radio worldwide, bringing you the top names in research and investigations seven nights a week. Our listeners connect to the KGRA on various platforms like TalkStream Live, TuneIn, Spreaker, iTunes, iHeartRadio, and many more. Now, you can stream your favorite paranormal talk radio shows with our new fully integrated custom of KGRA mobile apps for Android and iPhones. Listen to your favorite paranormal talk shows from any mobile device 24-7, free with smartphone or tablet. Utilize custom features to access news, show pages, archives, contests, events, and live interactive chat room. Set Set show notification alerts and never miss your favorite live programs. All free and available to download in Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Mark Slade Investigates, The Stephenville UFO. Written by renowned UFO investigator Ken Sherry, The Stephenville UFO tells the story of the infamous UFO sightings of Stephenville, Texas in 2008, where local residents witnessed unknown craft and lights in the sky chased by military planes. These sightings would set off a series of events that would quickly become one of the most controversial and well-documented UFO cases in U.S. history. Mark Slade investigates. The Stephenville UFO is a fascinating and frightening tale of sinister plots and shadow government agencies vying for control of the nation. Author and researcher Ken Cherry has woven an intricate tale that shines a light on an ominous chapter of American history and proving that not everything is as it seems. Mark Slade Investigates, The Stephenville UFO, is now available on Amazon.com.
And you're listening to January Waits by Septembrio. I want to thank Michael Eight from Septembrio again for providing the bumper music for us. You can find out more about them from Septembrio.com. And the uh, beautiful vocals there are Michael and background is Lizette Xavier. This is Alan B. Smith. If you want to find out more about our program and upcoming shows, just go to ParanormalNow.net or you can go to at ParanormalNow on Instagram or at paranormal underscore now on Twitter. We will be right back with Travis Walton to hear the rest of his fascinating tale. Nothing will change And I know that's not right Nothing will change Your contact for current news and trending topics. KGRARadio.com. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. This is Alan B. Smith. My guests tonight are Travis Walton and Jennifer Stein, director of the film Travis. Uh, so, Travis, we left it off in the last portion of the show. You were on the craft after being abducted, and you were on a bed looking up, and you saw a light and beings. What were those beings? What did they look like? Well, um, today they call them grays, but they didn't have that terminology back then. They were just small beings, hairless, very large eyes, and uh, their stare I found extremely disturbing. It, It seemed to give me a strange, uncomfortable feeling in my head. And uh, I come up with a theory eventually about what was causing that. I immediately became very combative, but at the time, I think they were trying to regain control of me, and it wasn't working due to my injury. Uh, That even combining forces, they were just unable to restrain me, and they had to come up with some other way to get my cooperation for my own good, to, to, I I think now, to uh, save my life. But did you feel... Did you feel out of control, um, you know, not just because of the unfamiliarity of the situation, but because you didn't know who these beings are or, you know? Well, the feeling of being injured, the feeling that I was something mortally wounded, that there was something really wrong inside, mm-hmm. that, uh, and the feeling of suffocation, you know. Uh, I've compared it to how overwhelming the uh, technique, uh, interrogation technique of waterboarding is. That the, the feeling of suffocation is generates a kind of fear that there's just nothing to compare to it, and you know combine all of that with the the cramped surroundings uh, uh, and uh, dim lighting and these strange beings and this squirmy feeling in my head. I, I later, after I was returned, I had a uh, an actual brainwave scan, an electroencephalograph that, uh, you know, come up with some um, readings that I think support that theory, that uh, there was some major trauma that uh, was preventing them from being able to control me, that that they basically gave up and turned it over to some human-looking beings who uh, I think uh, helped save my life. Some people think that they were actually the ones in charge, but I don't know about that. I, I have all I know is what I saw. Um, no one was responding to what my demands for an explanation. Where am I? I was just terrified about the feelings that you know were physically and uh, totally bizarre surroundings. But uh, they, uh, uh, after a struggle, uh, rendered me unconscious again. And uh, my next conscious memory was uh, back outside of uh, outside of Heber, the the town near where this happened. When you say struggle, do you, do you remember? Were you pushing back? Were you squirming? What, what does that mean? Well, initially they were trying to lead me over to the table and wanting me to lay down, and and at that point they were not responding to my questions at all, and. You know, rather than uh, going, 
continuing with the assumption that this was a rescue that perhaps, you know, maybe I was still in in dire straits. And so I started to resist, and they uh, forcefully uh, put me down on the table and uh, actually put what looked like just an ordinary oxygen mask over my face, and uh, I lost consciousness. Well, and and I said I wasn't going to do this. I'll do this just once. In Fire in the Sky, the visuals that they show from your experience of what you saw in the craft. Um, what is the difference between that and the reality that Jennifer's film represents? What what was well, all that well, you saw? Well, Jennifer relates what actually, actually happened. What, what uh, Fire in the Sky, the movie, was doing was basically fictionalized almost everything aboard the craft. The one thing that was a change that might have been justified was uh, a scene where the actor's uh, face is covered with a membrane never happened, but it's one way of uh, uh, communicating to the audience the feeling of suffocation, to try to scream, to try to breathe through something that's covering your face. You know, people can understand the panic that comes from, from that. Um, and I thought it was important for people to understand why I lost it. I mean, so many people thought, oh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, react that way. I'd stay calm and um, ask some good, reasonable questions and yeah. I come mean, away. Was this a, a mothership? Was this? Did you get a sense? Um, I wound up in a very large. It could have been a mothership, uh, what uh, what they call a mothership, or it could have been some kind of military or a building somewhere. It was either a, a very large building or a, or a larger craft. Right. And it, it was just one craft. Um, well, initially the craft that I woke up in was small, very cramped, very spare, very utilitarian. This didn't seem to have anything in it that would, uh, that where you could sleep or eat or anything like that. Um, Okay. And then you exit that craft. I exit that craft, and then I'm in this larger uh, building or craft. I see. Uh, where these human-looking ones. So I gave up on being so combative as I had been with the uh, small creatures, and uh, it wasn't until right up the end when they weren't telling me anything that I started fighting them back again. What did the the creatures look like the differences between the two well the the um people call these creatures grays but you know i'd say they were more whitish uh, whitish gray than, than gray but other than that you know hairless very large heads for their size and uh very very large eyes um but was it the typical black uh, eyes or no no that was one important difference uh, they had uh, eyes with an iris and a and a pupil mm -hmm. and uh but my theory uh was that to have eyes that large implies um uh, their normal environment is very low light that's the only only kind of a thing where you have large eyes. Any animal on Earth is, 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 that has huge eyes proportionally like that are either nocturnal or under uh, cave dwellers or under the deep sea or something like that. So um, if if their eyes are that uh, oversensitive, then then perhaps some sort of a black uh, sunglass sort of a filter could have been oh, placed over their eyes where they're anticipating being under brighter light. Now, what light we might consider normal might right. be way too bright for them. And the the humans, or the human-looking ones, were there any distinctive features that told you that they weren't quite human? Well, the first individual didn't, you know, it, I just assumed this was a, a human-looking person. But when I saw the others with him, they had a kind of a, a similar look amongst the group, like they're all one family or something, like a, uh, um, that's what made me, you know, uh, think that these weren't uh, humans after all. 
that this was uh, just um, an alien species that happens to look a lot like humans, probably enlisted, uh, summoned, just because they were the only ones I was going to not be combative with. Some people have the theory that they cooked up robots that would be more reassuring to me uh, or even some kind of a hypnotic illusion. But uh, I, I think um, the the idea that their mind control thing wasn't working, it doesn't support the idea that they could have any kind of a, an illusion that would be very effective with me to make them, me think that they were human. Um, uh, the uh, the brainwave scan, the EEG that I later yeah. uh, ha- had. Well, it's interesting you say that too, because in the Betty and Barney Hill case, um, I think Betty recalled that these beings had told her, you're not going to remember anything. And then later she did. And um, it makes you wonder, was it a misunderstanding of how the human mind works? Um, or is the mind a little bit more wily under traumatic um, instances. So maybe they've done controlled experiments, right, with people um, that haven't been traumatized or with a similar race. But then you put humans through a a traumatized state, I think it's probably more difficult to sort of control their mental narrative. Yeah, that's uh, definitely plausible. But I think even in in Betty's uh, case, she may have uh, begun to recall parts of it, but still not got it all. Right. So right. maybe the, maybe they were referring to the part that she was never going to get. You know, because I got little glimpses later that uh, I wonder if if those were dreams or or re- recovering memories. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Tracy Torme, the screenwriter on on Fire in the Sky, when I first told him about it, he. He thought they were just dreams, and then later on, he, he was quite confident they were uh, recovered memories. But uh, I don't know. Uh, well, I guess it, that's that's where it gets stickier. Um, but my understanding with hypnosis is that it's actually difficult to lead um, someone away from a true experience. Um, and I know that you you had issues and things to deal with as far as that goes later on in the story. But let, let's pick it up back in the in this craft. Um, so how, how many other crafts or other things did you see in the space once you left the small craft? Uh, the, I, I know there were at least two more, uh, disc shaped smaller craft in this big, uh, hangar like area. Uh, could have been another, I wasn't really studying my environment there so much mm-hmm. as wondering where I was being taken. I was more concerned with that. Plus, I was sort of stumbling because I, I was not physically all there yet, and he was hurrying me yeah. uh, faster than I felt like I could move easily. But it may have been, you know, um, um, medical um, considerations that uh, were making him hurry. Well, and you said you couldn't tell if it was a building um, or a craft. It could have been one or the other. Uh, what was the texture of that larger space like? What did it feel like? What did it look like? Well, the de- predominant thing was much brighter light, much fresher air, much more you know, a much more familiar environment, and uh, the light itself, especially, was so much like sunlight coming from these panels. Uh, I don't know if it was coming through a translucent panel and was actually just a window that was um, frosted or something, hmm. or if it was some kind of an artificial um, generator of, of so, uh, sunlight, like uh, light. Uh, and Mike, Mike Rogers and yourself, um, you both had mentioned feeling a vibration, hearing a sound. I think I think Mike said that there was like a high pitched sound that he heard too. Um, when yeah. you when you were in the craft, did you hear sounds at all, or anything that was similar to what you guys experienced? No, no. Inside, it was it was totally silent, and even when we exited the craft, that was quiet too. I I didn't hear any more mechanical noises, even with the craft that let me off. It was silent except for a light, mm-hmm. and then that went out. 
so why why the craft was initially emitting these bizarre sounds, I don't know. Uh, when I when I did uh, uh, gave a talk to an engineering college, university in in the Midwest, um, the students there were extremely interested in exactly what those sounds were like. Uh, apparently hoping that they could get some kind of a clue about the propulsion system or something. But um, I don't think I was too helpful. I, I did, you know, really get into his, a lot of detail comparing it to other kinds of sounds. Right. Um, but... Uh, okay, so then you're you're in this craft, the larger craft, um, and then what's the next thing that you remember after that? Did they, they took um, you somewhere else, or...? Yeah, they took me out of the larger room, uh, down a hallway to a smaller room. Mm-hmm. Uh, where there were some other uh, human-looking beings. Uh, and that was another thing, you know, being able to compare uh, these other beings with this guy as they were all wearing the same um, blue, tight-fitting uniform. Right. I call it a uniform only because they were all dressed alike. There was no insignia on it, no, no military um, gadgets or anything like that. No, no, no fact, visible symbols. Right, no, no visible symbols. Okay. But the one difference was the guy that was leading me out of the little craft had a helmet on, and the others didn't. And uh, what kind of helmet was it? Well, it was just a, a transparent helmet. It had a. It, it was com- completely clear, except maybe frosted or maybe fogging up in the back. And uh, um, sort of um, opaque um, collar around his neck. Mm-hmm. But uh, at the time, I was thinking that uh, that that may have been because the atmosphere wasn't correct for him or us in that little craft. But then, more recently, I thought, well, because I was so combative that maybe. It was just a sort of a defensive equipment, you know, wearing that in case I, I fought back, uh, continued oh. to fight back. Yeah, almost like a, a armor and hazmat suit in one. And I guess you were you were bigger than him because you said little guy. Um, well, no, he was he was pretty well built. He was as big as I was. Uh, uh, he wasn't like the um, small. Um, grays, uh-huh. uh, we'll call them grays if that's what people want to call them. But you know, people have come up with a number of other uh, names for these uh, human-looking beings. Um, you know, I'm, I'm completely open to as who they are, where they're from, even the possibility they were some sort of elite the uh, human force. But uh, I don't know. It, it, I think that's the le- less likely. Mm-hmm. Um, well, you... What made me lean away from that at the time is what would the odds be that there would be other beings that close to us? But now I, I realize that actually uh, the odds are quite good for a number of reasons. Yeah, I mean, evolutionarily speaking, you know, having two eyes in the front for binocular vision, vision makes sense. You know, having opposable, uh, you know, fingers and thumbs and uh, you need limbs to do things and if you look at all the, the animals on our planet uh how many of them have three legs right so right. there's a, there's a certain amount of balance that seems to favor um more highly intelligent beings though i, I guess the exception would sort of be uh, uh dolphins but again they're not at that 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 tier of human intelligence so uh so you're left the small craft you're in this giant space and they're taking you um, down the hallway. And where do they take you to? Well, into a, another room. Uh, this is looking a lot like an operating room, too. You know, they got this table. They went, uh, are leading me over to and trying to get me to lie down on. And that's where I started to fight back. I, but um, I think I, you know, was still... You know, I was in pretty good shape at the time, but in spite of my injuries, uh, not a, not not up to full strength. But there was three of them. They they felt very strong. I think they didn't have too much trouble mm-hmm. um, overwhelming me and getting me on the table. 
and uh, one of them, the female, and all the uh, look and difference between the male and the female is typical in humans. Um, uh, she put the mask on my face and uh, very quickly I lost consciousness, mm -hmm. painlessly, but uh, just pretty much grayed out. Right. And and was that it? And that was it until I woke up uh, on the highway. You woke up on the highway, and you know, how much of it is, is it accurate that you were near a phone booth, or did you have a far way to walk? Well, yeah, all that was true, but it was not raining. That was uh, was Hollywood embellishment. But uh, um, I was not naked, uh, but <laughs> I could right. see the the lights of the town down below. And in spite of the fact that you know, this is still dark, uh, and I felt traumatized by the memory of what I just experienced, you know, the fact that it was night still seemed like a big relief because it was familiar, uh, and and the town uh, there uh, was recognizable. Uh, so I ran down into the town and to, to get help, and uh, there was a a building there, still there to this day, and I pounded on the door, um, and uh, nobody came. Lights were on, and there was uh, steam or smoke coming out of the chimney. Yeah. But uh, whether no one heard me or whether they just thought there was a crazy madman out there screaming, uh, for whatever reason, nobody came. But I, I ran on down across the second bridge and found the phone booth, which to this day is still there, no longer functioning, but it's uh, still there. And... Uh, I, oh, I went into the one on the end and picked up the receiver. Uh, no dial tone. It was normal to be able to just pick up and get a dial tone. Sure. You could just dial operator and talk mm -hmm. to that uh, in a payphone at that time in, the, uh, in this country. And so I went into the middle one. It worked. And I screamed at the operator. She made, made connected me with the family. I called. And they were initially suspicious that this was another prank call. I, I I thought it was still the same night. I thought this was still Wednesday, but the, but um, so much time had gone by. They had been, you know, experiencing a whole lot of crank calls, uh, horrible people tormenting them. Right. That they thought it was a it was some kind of a prank. But uh, I convinced him it was really me. He said, "Okay, I'll get your brother." This was my brother-in-law. And uh, we'll come and get you. Well, Jennifer, and did I, you have a, a comment on the the phone call in the booth? Oh, I I said ask him to tell you about the uh, operator. <laughs> well, yeah, it, uh, the the uh, the debunker come up with the theory that I was never in any phone booth. I was really hidden off in some other location. But uh, it turns out that the operator listened in on the phone call. Because of my panic, you know, she knew about the incident and uh, notified the sheriff, which, although that was illegal, I was glad she did because it confirmed that that's where I really was. And uh, they, you know, the sheriff sent officers over there to, uh, you know, dust for prints. And, yeah. Um, so that was uh, another solid disconfirmation uh, as in every single debunker theory has been disproven. Documentable, provable facts show that they're just wrong. Well, there, but, there were uh, a lot of uh, debunking attempts, and you know, I'd like to get to some of those too, and, and there's still so much more to the story. And uh, we've only got just about a half an hour left. So um, I'm, I'm going to pause the story here and I'm going to let some of the people ask you some questions. Um, and uh, first from uh, Facebook questions, this one's from Carol Carl. Um, and she said, uh, I'm intrigued by how the uh, this impacted Travis's dream life, your entire experience, um, i.e. before the event, uh, was he one who had recalled his dreams um, and after the event, you know, are you able to recall dreams different? Um, you know, what she has come to think of as other intelligence, whether, is there any kind of shift? Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. 
you know, and of course, this is totally subjective. This is just me telling you what happened. And I've always tried to stick to things I can document, things I can prove. And the best I can tell you is that my wife at the time, you know, is willing to confirm that I would wake up in the middle of the night, you know, in a in a total panic, you know. Uh, and there was this sort of a black whirlpool in front of my eyes, you know. I don't know. It was a... a, a uh, she would also describe um, me sounding like I was co- in combat, that I was fighting someone in my sleep. Uh-huh. Yeah. And uh, those kinds of dreams, uh, you know, would interrupt my sleep, made it very hard to rest. And, and you know, it was just draining on me. But over the years, as uh, um, th- that faded... Uh, it wasn't until in, in the 90s when I started doing a lot of interviews for the movie when I started having dreams that weren't of these uh, smaller creatures. They were more of the more human-looking ones. Right. And that's that's when I uh, inquired, well, could they be returning memories? And, um, and I mean, how, how does one discern? How would you know um, if they're discerning memories? Uh, returning memories or not? Well, they seem to fit in with what I recall, you know. Uh, it was like I was on my back being transported somewhere, these, these kinds of things. Little, no, Nothing that, you know, told a story, nothing that, you know, that I could put together into something that made sense. But, sure. Uh, uh, so they're more like, like glimpses. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So we have another question from um, Robert Lee. Now, this is a very long question, so I'm going to uh, condense it as best as possible. Um, He finishes it with, um, did Travis read Heinlein science fiction prior to November 5th, 1975? Um, And if not, how does he explain that almost every element of his story can be found in a 1958 sci-fi novel? So, you know, he states there are a number of parallels um, you know, blasted unconsciousness by a bloom, a beam of blue light, um, wake up lying on their backs in a wedge-shaped room, are groggy and don't know why and where they are and how they got there, et cetera, et cetera. Um, are you familiar with this, Travis? I, I was uh, apprised of this theory by a, a debunker named Carl Flock, hmm. uh, who <laughs> came up with that stuff, but uh, I, it doesn't fit at all, <laughs> actually. You know, it, uh, that, that some spacecraft might be round. Oh wow! That there might be lights. Wow! You know, I, you know, you could, it could, it wouldn't be just Heinlein. It would be many, many different stories that Hollywood has come up with over the years. And no, I, I, I didn't read the story even after Flock's theory. It was other uh, ufologists who uh, um, looked into it and said that he was really reaching to try to make a comparison. It wasn't the same at all. You think Fire in the Sky, the movie, departed from what actually happened? You know, the Heinlein story is actually, you know, nothing like it, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, and it's interesting you say that, too, because um, you, you know Ted Peters, correct? Yes. So uh, who? Uh, Ted Peters. He's been um, on the show several times. I know he's done MUFON conferences and uh, he wrote a book called UFOs, um, God's Chariots, question mark. And you know, he, he does draw parallels, um, much like Jacques Vallée, with the re- a religious aspect to some of these E.T. encounters. Um, and what I think is most poignant about that is that you can have sort of archetypal experiences, um, spiritual and physical, real life fantasy and dream that have very similar attributes to them and that doesn't necessarily negate that one or the other is true or not um and to dig into that is extraordinarily fascinating of course we don't have time to do that 
Um, so I'll, I'll move on to the, the next question from Dan. Well, you know, okay. if you're looking to make things fit, you can make things fit. And I've seen this, you know, and it's in politics all over television right now. Mm -hmm. If you want to make it fit, you can make it fit. But uh, when you come out with these kinds of theories, whether it's the lightning bolt uh, caused uh, hallucination, whether it's the drug hallucination, you still have to explain seven people uh, going through the thing, same thing to the last the umpth degree, you know, did all of those guys read Heinlein, you know? Right. Well, um, and, and we touched on this earlier, Philip Klass. I mean, he was a, a well-known debunker, um, you know, and the debunkers that... Well, he threw everything that, at it. He had yeah. that, eight different theories, uh, mutually exclusive theories. Right. And he uh, often contradicted himself, didn't he? Because he... He, he certainly did. Right. And I, and I mean, on Larry yeah. King, you know, in the same interview, he had me uh, flying through the air and landing on rocks that should have caused bruises. The, the doctor found no bruises, he says. But at the same time, he's saying the area was covered with a thick carpet of pine needles, which, of course, gets rid of the idea that I would have been bruised by rocks. But these pine needles should have caught fire and they should have burned. So he was right in the same interview with Larry King. He's he's putting two theories out uh, to <laughs> to attack the same uh, part of the story. Well, Travis and Jennifer, I don't know if you guys have seen this. There's a a YouTube channel called Body Language, and they analyze people's physical movements, and how they breathe, how they hold themselves, um, and they did a video on your Larry King um, live. Uh, interview with uh, Philip Glass and you know from what I can tell they are pretty objective they're not a paranormal site in that you know that they're totally biased and their conclusion was that you um, and I think Mike was with you were were telling the truth and that Philip Glass was showing signs of uh, fabrication yeah, and it was documented after he passed away that he was lying because we got a hold of his FBI file uh, through the Freedom of Information Act mm -hmm. that he was being investigated by the FBI for revealing classified information in connection with his job. And uh, actually, uh, some of those uh, uh, emails in there suggest that um, they had some goods on him and they turned him over to the CIA uh, with the threat of prosecution being that, you know, he's going to be their man now. Right. All right. And if you're listening and you want to call in to speak with uh, Travis or Jennifer, just call 929-US-929-279-3304. Again, that's 929 279 33 04 to speak with Travis or Jennifer and if you have any questions um, and I have uh, one more question here that I'd like to get to you Travis as well this is from Michael Hill um, he said I would love to hear your thoughts on the human element of your abduction experience and um, your opinion regarding the possible terrestrial origin cooperation of some abduction experiences all right, well, I will, you know, I have done some theorizing, and I'd like to emphasize when I'm theorizing, I, it's my opinion. I, you know, I'll stick strictly to the facts of what happened as much as I can, but if you want me to tell you what I think, I think that these theories that that the um, aliens, uh, that, they, that, that our intelligence agencies are in cahoots with the aliens to help them uh, take over the Earth, I think is absurd. You know, I, th I, I think that there is some uh, secrecy on the part of our government, uh, but I think it's totally justifiable. Um, I think they know more about the question than we do, although I don't think they know everything. Uh, but they, I, I think it's, it's wise for them not to reveal to the world the ex exact extent of what they know. They got to keep our enemies guessing. Uh, anything that you know they, that full disclosure would reveal, people are so hungry for them to inform us, American citizens. We have the right to know this stuff. Well, anything they reveal is going to be revealed to our enemies too, and that's not a good idea. 
uh, keep them guessing. You know, I think uh, these these men are, uh, you know, you you know what they say about the, uh, secrets. <laughs> they they can't really keep secrets. Uh, we know they know stuff, but the idea of them uh, conspiring uh, to take over the planet, uh, uh, I, I don't. I don't think they hold uh, water. Uh, these people have families. They live here. What, what, what are they going to do, you know? And, and the other thing is, with the level of technology that these uh, alien civilizations possess, far above us, that if they wanted the Earth, it'd already be theirs. They wouldn't need to sneak around. It wouldn't take years and years. Uh, uh, overnight, uh, we'd never know what hit us. Right. I mean, that would be the ancient alien theory that they've been here for thousands of years if they've been here for thousands of years and they want to take over what's taking them so long. Um, I have a question here from Anonymous. Uh, wanted to know, are you now, do you feel that, are you in any way abnormally healthy? Well, I am unusually healthy, but, you know... <laughs> The debunkers will say that's just a coincidence. I, you know, I don't drink or smoke. I try to live healthy, and mm -hmm. um, I've always been very physically fit. But um, I, I was looking for, you know, with all the stress and everything, that uh, come down with some horrible unidentified disease. But I waited until I uh, could go into my employers and prove that I never called in sick one time in 40 years. Uh, now, whether that's a coincidence or sort of a after effect of the repairs they did on me, who can say? But right. um, every time one of my family members say, oh, I feel so sick, I, I, I'm reminded, damn, you know, I, I don't remember, you know, in, in years and years, uh, almost forgotten what, what it's like when they just start describing the discomforts of colds and flu and whatnot. Yeah, you I, know, I, I hold the kids when they're sick and stuff, and I just don't come down with that. I, that's you know, amazing. I'm, um, I'm at all these conferences, shaking hands with hundreds of people, and yeah, yeah. Um, I just don't get sick. Well, do you have, are you familiar with the film Unbreakable by M. Night Shyamalan? Where Bruce Willis's character just over time, it's revealed. Oh, yeah, he was like a train wreck or something. Yeah, yeah, and like, and things just happened to him, and it was like, why, why am I? Why is he not getting injured? Why is he not getting sick? And it took him a while to realize, oh, something's abnormal about me in that regard. It's a, it's a fascinating film, and actually, the sequel is coming, coming soon. Um, but I have another question here, uh, Travis. Have any of your fellow loggers who saw the bright light? The flying ship that day in the forest pursued ufology. Well, um, I think it's only human nature that they would, in some ways, uh, be averse to the subject. But you know, they've all reacted to it in different ways on their own, um, um, different ways. Um, for a while, Mike was at the forefront but, uh, of. Uh, battling back because so many of the theories had to do with his his uh, contract with the Forest Service. Well, you know, he has signed affidavits from the contracting officers themselves that n there was no way this event could have been uh, anticipated to benefit him, uh, did not benefit him, it hurt him, and uh, it never was even brought up at the uh, at the uh, in at the meeting where the, the contract was terminated. It wasn't even discussed. Mike never even brought it up. And uh, they they uh, signed an affidavit saying there's no way this could have uh, benefited him in any way. So he's basically defending his own reputation. Uh, so he, he was very effective at uh, battling with Philip Glass over this stuff. Okay. Uh, getting into the all the particulars of these theories, which now have been thoroughly debunked. You know, he was the guy who was fraudulent. There was one instance where his bribe attempt on the youngest guy on the crew um, was it was something he couldn't uh, deny because the, the the message from Philip Class was carried by the local deputy Jim Click, and so. Um, 
his defense was when Mike said, if, if you would take that bribe money, then even though you know it really happened and would do it just for the money, then you'll be bruised. Well, Philip Class took that quotation and took the middle out of the sentence and substituted three little dots in order to reverse the meaning. If you take that money, you'll be bruised. Trying to imply that Steve was uh, uh, considering, um, you know, telling the truth about uh, uh, a like false a story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but when in actuality, you know, even though you know it really happened and do it, do it just for the money, to take that part of the sentence out is just classic, classic uh, Philip Class technique for him to alter quotations to, in order to reverse the meaning, to to you know basically deceive the public yeah and they did it unabashedly and the thing is that if you are reading an article by one of these guys or um they're being referenced in an article and you're sort of a lay person you think okay well that makes that that sounds reasonable that's what a human would well do. yeah they <laughs> explained it all the way there we go mm-hmm. you know like for instance one of the inquirer reporters uh, that wrote up the original uh, National Enquirer story, later decided to try to cash in and recycle some of his old stories. But he did two rewrites. In one story, he said that Dwayne and Travis were total teetotalers. In the next version, we came out staggering drunk, and so were the psychiatrists that had been in, interviewing me. Mm-hmm. So, you know, totally contradicting himself, 180, you know, but that's the kind of thing we're constantly encountering people, uh, you know, do, saying and doing things that were, you know, disprovable. But when people hear the version that comes out all on its own, well, Philip Class said it was the planet Jupiter, you know, uh, uh, you know, they're deceived. Yeah. Uh, Jennifer, I have a question uh, for you, actually. Um, so... It goes like this. Uh, Do you believe religion and or the acceptance of extraterrestrials, worlds beyond ours, diminishes the belief of a heaven in the clouds? My person. I'm going to let Travis take a peek at that one. (laughs) My personal opinion is... is, uh, uh, Hell no. (laughs) No. Heavens no. Heavens no because... um, what, what I say to people who ask me that question is, what is there about all-powerful and all-knowing that you don't understand? You know, they, they're so limited in their conception of uh, God mm-hmm. that if there's any life outside of this planet that, that somebody else must have created it, well, you know, creation is a very big thing. And... Uh, uh, to place limita- uh, uh, limitations on on how big creation is, uh, I think they're selling God short. Well, you know, it's yeah, a, I'll, 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 I'll agree with Travis. I think more of the universe lies hidden from our ability to perceive and understand and and travel and observe within it. So right now, we live in a very small uh, perspective. And People it's hard to say, keep our minds open. If it's not in the Bible, it doesn't happen. You know, I say, well, um, Native Americans aren't in the Bible. Antarctica's not in the Bible. You know, the Bible, you know, uh, is does not pur- even purport to be about everything. Well, I, I certainly agree with you, Travis, as far as uh, it. I don't know what God is. You know, I I don't know if that's a male or female, an entity, if it is just everything evolving as as time goes on. Was it was it really something that said, okay, I'm going to do A plus B equals this? Um, it's such a grand mystery that I I I personally no longer prescribe to a particular religion because the religion seems to try to explain something that I think, like you said, is inexplicable. There's just no way to understand it. I think the most reliable parts of religions are the parts they all share in common. Right, and the I, things I, that speak to everyone, yeah. um, the, the the things that they that don't contradict each other, most likely the parts that are the truest. Yeah, 
I, I mean, for me, I would say the main tenet of that would be love, what, as abstract yes. as that may be. But I, I just I feel that in my core. The ultimate life force, pure love. Mm -hmm. the, you know, basics are the are the most reliable parts of it. Well, do you, uh, you know, do you do anything for your own spiritual life at all, or? Well, you know, I was raised as a Mormon, but I don't attend a church, uh, you know, uh, except on special occasions. Uh, uh, my nephew was returned from his mission a couple weeks uh, weekends ago, so I, I was in in uh, church for that. But uh, uh, personally, I consider myself more spiritual than religious, and mm -hmm. people wonder what the difference. Well, that's a whole that's a whole separate show. <laughs> yeah, well, has this experience um, heightened your spirituality? I think it has, uh -huh. but of course that's subjective. <laughs> true, true, and um, I'm not sure if this is asked much of you because your story is so compelling. But I'm sure you've spoken to other abductees over the years. Um, is there a kinship that you that you feel with any of those other people? Oh yeah, um, you know, a certain experiencers, you know, there's a there's a certain um, vibe that they they perceive in me immediately and I in them, you yeah. know. But you know, people ask me, what do I think about this case or that case? I've always been reluctant to put myself in the position of passing judgment on someone else's case that I haven't thoroughly investigated, because. As far as anything I represent to the public about my own case, I should be follow the same rules with theirs. What can I document? People bring me a story and I say, how do you know this? What verifiable facts can you point me to where I'll be as certain of that as you are? And sometimes they're stutter and stammer and don't know how to answer that one but uh, you know that's kind of what you have to go by uh, you know the truth comes down to facts and reasoning are your facts uh, verifiable is your reasoning valid non self con contradicting um, there, there are you know, rules to what valid reasoning is but you know it's a it's a something that's missing in our educational system. Well, critical is, thinking. Uh, yeah, critical thinking. Absolutely. Yeah. No, I t totally agree. Um, Jennifer, how do you how do you feel about about how the the society um, here in the US at least, I'm not sure about worldwide, but the society here how it processes these reports and stories like Travis. I mean, are are they thinking intelligently or are they just going oh entertaining story i believe that well i think it depends on who you're listening to i've been a member of mufon for a long time and certainly we have you know phds and scientists and ex-military people coming together to sort of do the work that the government isn't kind of really willing to do openly with us any longer after the Project Blue Book uh, was closed. Um, so if you are, say, you know, a journal member to MUFON, or you're going online and reading things, or you're going to the UFO Reporting Center, I think you're getting great information uh, that's available. And there's, you know, fabulous periodicals and magazines online around the world. Uh, out of the UK, there's Phenomenon Magazine and UFO Magazine. Mm -hmm. So um, there is information out there. Now, if you're looking at how the general media looks at this, being a media person as a filmmaker, I think that the, you know, generally, uh, n say, n news media doesn't do a very good job of trying to report the facts, except this past December, they did a decent job in reporting uh, the December uh, 17th announcement that came out, or December 16th it was. Uh, Luis Elizondo from the Pentagon, from the former ATIP program. Media took that pretty well and reported it pretty directly because of the caliber 
of the person coming forward, a former Pentagon, you know, a deputy responsible for a serious UFO investigating program. Mm -hmm. Well, it was called the uh, Advanced Aviation or Advanced Aerial Threat Detection Program or or Advanced uh, Aerospace Threat Detection Program. It was called both. Uh, So whether that's a disinformation campaign out there to make people wrong, we don't know, but both were reported as titles of this project. So that was reported pretty well. Uh, I give the media a lot of credit that they they did an honest job of it. But I think you have to be a discerning uh, and a bit of a skeptical uh, observer and reader, and you have to rely on your own experience as well as reliable sources. And it's a hard topic to make sense of. This isn't easy. If it was easy, it'd be common knowledge and it would be, you know, a done deal and people would have a more open acceptance of this. But it's not an easy topic to wrap your brain around. So I, I encourage skepticism. I encourage people to be curious, to do their own reading and do their own research because they, you can't always rely on what someone's going to tell you about something that's been hidden deliberately for 70 years and debunked. Right. It's, and it's, it's, it's a hot potato. <laughs> it's a hot potato and it's that drive, that need for evidence. And in your film, uh, you guys reveal something really interesting as far as the trees go that I'd not been aware of until I watched the the film. Can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. Um, while we were at the site, we, uh, with Travis, one of the last uh, trips we made up there, we started to walk around sort of, we wanted to map it out and then fly over it with the drone so we could c- clearly see with yellow tape on the ground, you know, like caution uh, banners we were using, where the actual site was. So as we were going around looking at the trees, we noticed that the trees had a directionality to the increased growth rate. And that directionality seemed to face towards the center or the epicenter where the craft had been hovering. So that each tree sort of around in a circle had rapid growth on one side of it, but not on the opposite side. And none of the rapid growth was the same in the same location on any single tree. So I called it, for simplification purposes, rapid epicentric growth pointing towards the center where the craft had been. And you can't fake that kind of data. And the tree growth was 33% greater than other trees in the area. And when comparing that, which Ben Hansen was... uh, Uh, a great researcher and helped me with this. He had dug up a a white paper, a scientific paper done by a university, I believe it was in Poland or Germany. And they went and studied the radiation effects on the Scott pine tree in the area of Chernobyl. And within a five mile radius of that accident where most of the radiation effect is, has the largest impact, the Scott pine tree grew for 15 years at a 33% rapid growth rate around the area where Chernobyl was sort of an Uh, I don't know that they found directionality, but I bet if they looked for it, they would find that as well. Well, I doubt doubt there would be any directionality because the radiation was basically descending in a cloud around these trees. Probably, yes, you're probably right. Right, right, There wouldn't be a central uh, source of the radiation, but, but it does document the fact that radiation somehow stimulates rapid growth in pine trees. Yeah, it, it's absolutely right. fascinating. Um, we are just well, that, at the that's end. That's kind of counterintuitive. You would think radiation would kill plants. No, it does. It does very strange things, especially in the Chernobyl area. Um, and they're still studying that. Uh, you know, it's it's you know, not that we're going to get X Men anytime soon, but it's you know, it's pretty bizarre what radiation does. And I don't think we have a, a firm grasp on on magnetism on radiation. Um, and that's why, you know, ufologists and people like yourselves that need to, to stay on top of this and, and try to, you know, use the best science available and apply it to this field. Um, so I encourage everyone to go out there and get this film. Jen, where can they get uh, Travis? Well, they can get it from Travis's website. I'll promote that. It's TravisWalton.com. They can also get it from TravisWaltonTheMovie.com. And they can begin to look for it um, on, uh, I think it's out on Amazon now as well as a streaming film. And that's the latest version. Um, And they just Google under the title Travis 
uh, the true story of Travis Walton. We're also looking to release um, uh, the film under another title called Alien Abduction because documentaries that start with the letter A do 80% better (laughs) just because they appear first in the Mm, list. So we're also going to release a version it's called Alien Abduction, and it, it will it will just probably do better on the streaming you know platforms like Netflix and Hulu. Sure. And we're you know we're working at getting it out there on the other streaming platforms. Well, but, one other opportunity to see it would be where it's actually being shown at an event where Jennifer or I uh, are, are speaking. Right, and you can find that um, information on the website, I believe. And Travis, um, we're, we have to sign off here in a second. Would you like to leave us with anything that you typically don't get a chance to share or are not asked? Well, you know, I would like to say to people, if if you want to know what the truth is about this phenomenon, uh, first, find the facts. And, you know, not just some theory that somebody's, you know, if, you, if you're afraid and you want it to not be true, don't just don't begin with a, a preference. Right. Just be open right. to whatever, wherever the facts lead you. And Jennifer, not, not where some debunker leads you. Right. And what about yourself? Oh, a final sign off. Mm. Gosh. <laughs> uh, well, the world is more mysterious than we know. You know, I always think of the line in uh, Shakespeare. Uh, you know, Horatio, <laughs> that that line, you know, there's there's more uh, in the world and in your imagination than is written about in your philosophy. Right. right. Yeah. yeah. And, and the imagination is quite powerful and amazing. And, and still, you have to wonder, you know, what what is going on out there? Um, you know, so again, let's um, let's give support to Travis and to Jennifer for all the hard work um, that they've done. And uh, I, for all those people who. Um, are more skeptical and we're hoping that we could cover more in the gar- regards to the work the de- debunkers have done, although Travis did touch on that, um, and some of more of the factual evidence. Uh, Jennifer and Travis, would you be open to coming on for a shorter segment in the future and we can maybe absolutely. talk about that? Sure, yeah, I, absolutely. I, I, I gave a talk once. Uh, 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 that was my whole uh, theme there was how do we know what cases that we can rely on what are the you know it was kind of a mini course in critical thinking all right fantastic well that's it travis jennifer thank you so much for coming on thanks for having us all right have a good night okay this is alan b smith for paranormal now um broadcasting on spreaker but we are live on kgra radio i'm sorry rebroadcast on kgra radio at 1 a.m every Wednesday night, Thursday morning. Um, You can find out more about us at paranormalnow.net and um, kgrradio.com slash paranormalnow or on Instagram at paranormalnow or on Twitter at paranormal underscore now. You have been listening to a... Another show of Paranormal Now on the KGRA lineup, your official contact for the best in alternative talk radio. Um, Thanks again, everybody, for your questions. Thank you for participating. And thank you for all of your support for keeping Paranormal Now going after all these years and transactions between different platforms. And again, grateful to Race Hobbs and Bill at KGRA for getting Paranormal Now on their platform. Okay, that's it out of me. And to the rest of you, until next time, live in the mystery. This is Paranormal Now. I'm your host, Alan B. Smith. The brain reflects the universe. In a sense, aren't you kind of dabbling in the occult? Absolutely, yeah. It's a kind of vision quest. There have been over a dozen PhD pieces done about UFOs. You never hear about them. Don't bother me with the facts. My mind's made up. And I reluctantly move my left hand over to my wife's leg and realize that she's in bed with me. She's not outside the door. And there's someone mimicking her voice outside my room. Paranormal Now, now airing every Thursday, 1 a.m. on KGRA Radio. <laughs>